My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine. For Thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art Thou. If ever I love Thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love Thee because Thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love Thee for where the thorns on Thy brow. If ever I love Thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love Thee in life, I will love Thee in death. And praise Thee as long as Thou lendest me breath. And say when the death do lies cold on my brow, if ever I love Thee, my Jesus, tis now. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore Thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with a glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Hello, my friend. Welcome to the Bible Trail. We're glad that you've joined us for our Bible study program here today at Antioch Missionary Baptist Church and online. And um, we uh, hope that you receive a blessing from our Bible study today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. And uh, after that, we'll have uh, another hymn, and then we'll get back into the Word of God together. Lord Jesus, Lord, we thank you so very much for the salvation that you purchased on that cross so long ago, that you paid for with your own blood. Lord, that, that you proved was accomplished by your resurrection. Dear God, I pray that you would bless the preaching of the gospel on this program. If there is anyone listening that's lost, I pray, dear God, that they would be saved. Lord, for those of us that are saved, I pray that we might be motivated to be better Christians, that we might be edified. Dear God, we pray for our churches and for our country, for our world as we still face this epidemic. Lord, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We just pray, dear God, that you would get us through it. Lord, that we might open the doors to the, the church house again and gather again as one body in Christ. Lord Jesus, we pray that all of your churches may be able to do so. Lord God, we just pray that uh, you would give our leaders and the doctors the guidance and the wisdom they need in this crisis. Forgive us of our sins. Be with us today. All these things we ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, for our next song, let's go ahead and look at, oh, number 145. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know it is the spirit of the Lord. Sweet expressions on each face, and I know they feel the presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with. Your love, and for these blessings, 
We lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. Amen. Let's grab our Bibles. We're going to continue with our wagon train through the Word of God. We're going to be back in John chapter number 3 again today. Last week, um, we looked at the doctrine of baptism. Um, we saw where John the Baptist was, was still baptizing folks, and Jesus had given his uh, disciples personal authority to, to baptize. Um, and, uh, you know, today we're going to try to finish out the, the, the Gospel of John and look at some important truths that uh, the Apostle John has to tell us there um, in the end of John chapter number 3. So we're going to be picking up there in verse 27. Before we do, I want to, I, I, I was rushed towards the end in our last message because I was already well over and I hit every point that I really wanted to hit, but I want to make one thing very clear that I didn't get to, and that is that baptizing little babies or little children who are unable to understand what they're doing is unscriptural. You know, we said you had to have a proper mode. We've discussed that at length, which is immersion. We did talk about a proper authority. That that's the authority of Jesus Christ is found in the local New Testament church, and we see that in, in uh, the, the Great Commission. But a, a proper candidate is someone who is a believer, somebody who has repented and placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And a little baby that's under the age of accountability or a little child that's under the age of accountability, they are incapable of doing that, and therefore there is no reason for them to be uh, baptized. It has to be something that they themselves voluntarily submit to understanding what it is that they're doing. With that being said, let's pick up in verse 27 where it says, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Now this is an answer to his disciples coming. You know, let's back up to verse 26 again. And they say, they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. You see, some of John's uh, disciples had gotten into a, a discussion um, you know, with the Jews about purifying, about ritual washing. And, you know, I, I don't quite understand how this led to their discussion about Jesus. Maybe Jesus was there baptizing people and, you know, the people who were rejecting Jesus, the Jewish religious authorities, maybe they had heard Jesus preach something that they thought was contrary to their tradition. You know, the Jews believed that you have to have all kinds of ritual washings and, and, and so forth to, to, to be right with God. God, but maybe in that discussion, the disciples that were there that were John's, they saw Jesus baptizing and baptizing more people than their guy John was. And so they come here to John and, uh, you know, they're kind of complaining about it. They say, um, you know, to whom thou, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. You know, they're supposed to be coming to you, John. They're all going to Jesus. What's up with this? Why, why is this happening? And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Now, you know, John is, what he's saying here is that if Jesus is baptizing more people than I am, if his ministry is bigger than I am, than mine is, it's because of God. It's because God has made it that way. And as we're going to see, John was not surprised by this. He understood his place. He knew that he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He knew that he had been sent as the forerunner of the Messiah, that he had been sent as the herald of the King. He understood that he was supposed to become less prominent and Jesus uh, become more prominent. You know, I see in the world today Hey, um, a lot of times, you know, amongst even preachers, they get jealous over the fact that someone else, you know, their ministry seems to be thriving more. They have more people in their congregation or, 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 or something like this. Whatever we have, we have it of the Lord. Um, I'm not sure what preacher it was that said it when he heard a, a fellow preacher 
um, complaining about my congregation isn't big enough. You know, the, the older, wiser preacher said to him, well, maybe your congregation is as big as you'd like to give an account for, you know, when you stand before the Lord. And there's a lot of truth in that. We're all going to have to stand before the Lord. Preachers, especially pastors, are going to have to stand before the Lord and give an account, not just of themselves, but of the people over whom the Lord made them pastor. So, you know, wherever your ministry's at, you know, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, be content, and what you have is given to you of the Lord. Look, if you would, at 1 Corinthians 4, 7. You know, what do we have of the Lord? 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? You know, preachers, you know, pastors who, who, who pastor smaller churches, they ought not be jealous of pastors that pastor bigger ones. And pastors of bigger churches ought not to take glory in the fact that their churches are bigger than some other men's uh, churches. Uh, not that it's men's churches, it's the Lord's churches, but it's the churches over which pastors have been set. The point is, whatever we have, we have of God. Whatever we've accomplished, remember we talked at the end of uh, Jesus' discourse there with Nicodemus, there in chapter 3 of John that uh, you know those that come to the light we read um, in verse 21 but he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God meaning they were done by the power of God not by our own power and so whatever we have we have of the Lord look at Hebrews 5 and 4 Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 4 Where we read, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Now this passage is dealing specifically with the fact that Aaron was called by God to be a high priest. He didn't make himself a high priest. He didn't call himself to be a high priest. And Jesus Christ was made a priest after the order of Melchizedek by God the Father. He didn't, you know, the, the doctrine of the Trinity kind of comes in there. And it might get a little complicated. But as far as, you know, the relationship between God the Father and God the Son, the Son was doing the will of the Father. He wasn't doing his own own will. And in the same way, preachers who are truly called by the Lord Jesus Christ, preachers that are truly called by God, they did not call themselves. You don't choose the ministry. God chooses you. There's a place later in the Gospel of John where Jesus says to His disciples, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. That's not talking about salvation. That's talking about He chose them to be apostles and He chose them to be ministers. He chose them to be special servants for Him. And it's the same way for preachers today. If, God, if you are a preacher, it better be because God called you to preach. Not You have it from God, like John the Baptist did. You don't have it from a, uh, a church. You have to have the authority of the church to be a pastor and to to uh, you know, to to, to 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 do the ministry, but what I mean is that the church does not call a man to be a pastor. A church recognizes when God has called a man to be a pastor and ordains them, and that's an important distinction. If you're a preacher, it better not be because your mom and daddy said you needed to be a preacher, or because somebody in the church said you needed to be a preacher, or because you felt like it was expected of you by human beings. Only God has the power to call you to preach, and if He calls you to preach, you better be obedient and answer that call. A lot of men are not answering the call today. We have a preacher shortage today. We have a church shortage today. We need men to surrender to preach and become church planters and to go out and to, to plant new churches for the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, if you would, look at James 1.17. James 1 and 17. Where we read, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You know, every gift that you have, let's take it down another notch. You know, I've talked about John the Baptist having, you know, his ministry from the Lord and preachers having their ministry from the Lord. You may not be called to preach, but whatever gifts you have, you owe it to God. Every blessing that you have, every joy that you have, it all belongs to God and came down 
from Him. Getting back to John chapter number 3, and um, we were there, and uh, look at verse uh, 28. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before Him. You know, John is, is, is telling them, you heard me say it. I never claimed to be the Messiah. You go back to John chapter 1, the Jewish religious leaders have sent folks from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? They asked him plainly, are you the Messiah? And he said, no. So, you know, John's disciples here, I've often wondered, why were they still following John? Why hadn't they followed Jesus yet? I'm not quite sure of that. Maybe the Lord will explain it to me one day. But John was telling them, I'm not the Messiah. How many times do I have to say it? And he goes on in verse 29, he says, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Now, weddings done in Jewish days of Israel were much different than they are today. When we have a wedding today, we're waiting on the bride to show up. The preacher's standing there, the groom is standing there, the best man is standing there, and the people are there in the pews, and we're all waiting for the bride to show up. The bride is the centerpiece of the modern Western American wedding. But in the days of ancient Israel, it was the groom that you were waiting on. And the job of the best man was to be the groom's stand-in, was to kind of be the host of the party, the wedding party, if you will, and, um, you know, entertain the guests and, and uh, you know, just be there to represent the groom. And then the groom arrives. It's kind of like, you know, the second coming of Christ. That's the way that that, that that works. The bride is waiting here on the earth and we're waiting for Jesus to come. And so, you know, number one, John is using this picture of a wedding metaphorically. And he's saying, listen, the bride is the one, the groom, okay, is the one to whom the bride belongs. But the bridegroom's friend... The best man, his job, look, look at it again there. It says, verse 29, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. You know, that best man who's the, the host of the party till the bridegroom gets there, he knows the bridegroom's coming. He knows this party isn't all about him. He knows as soon as the groom shows up, it's his job to fade gracefully into the background and let the groom become the, the center of attention. And that's what John is saying he's doing with Jesus. He says, I, Jesus is the bridegroom and I am the bridegroom's friend. I'm the best man. And since Jesus has shown up, it's my job to back up and let Jesus take center stage. But my friend, I believe that we see a little bit more in this verse. And I ask you to bear with me as we, as we talk about it. You see, in the scripture, the local New Testament church, and remember, John here is talking about people who were going to be composing the Lord's New Testament church. Maybe, you know, we're at the point in John where maybe we're past, um, you know, Matthew... Uh, uh, are getting close to where we were at in Matthew chapter number four. It may still be about six months away or, or, or almost there. But, but, but the point is, is that the church that, uh, I got a visitor here. I'm asking him to come on in and have a seat in the, uh, pulpit while I, in the pews while I teach. Um, but, uh, anyhow, um, John is saying that the, the purpose for which he had come to, to be the bridegroom, that was over and that was done with. The bride belongs unto Jesus and the bride is the local New Testament um, church. And I want to show that to you. Look, if you would, at... Uh, let me look at my notes here. Go to Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse 25. Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse 25. Where it says, Husbands, love your wives 
even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so the church there is metaphorically called the bride of Christ. And remember, John, it was foretold that he would prepare a people for the Lord. He did not organize the church, but he prepared the material. He prepared the disciples that Jesus would use to um, build his local New Testament church. We also see that the church is metaphorically called the bride of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse 2, where Paul says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So, you know, we get saved for a purpose. We get saved so that we can serve God. We get saved so that we can go on and get baptized and profess Him publicly, so that we can enter into a covenant relationship with the Lord's New Testament church. And the Lord's New Testament church is called the Bride of Christ. And I believe that we as the Bride of Christ have a special destiny, a special reward waiting for us in heaven. If you look there at uh, Revelation chapter 21, and verse 9, we see that the Lord's church is the uh, primary inhabitant of the city of New Jerusalem that is listed. Revelation chapter number 21 and verse 9, we read, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven... Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at, yeah, I'm at the right place. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And so, for those who are saved... But not only faithful, but not only saved, but faithful, faithful members of the Lord's true New Testament churches, we're going to get to live in that city. And if you read that whole chapter, there are people who live outside the city. Now, they all have access to it. They all come in. But it will be the bride that will be the closest to Jesus. It will be the bride that enjoys that, that special um, sp place of fellowship with God in the heaven ages and before that in the millennium. Now, now don't accuse me as a lot of people accuse us old landmark missionary Baptists of saying that you got to be a Baptist to be, go to heaven. You do not. But what I am saying is that there is a special reward for those who are faithful. For those who are faithful in getting scriptural baptism. For those who are faithful in being a, a member of the Lord's New Testament church and serving the Lord and carrying out the Great Commission. Don't think that everyone's going to have the same level of rewards in heaven. They're not. You have to be faithful if you want to earn rewards uh, in heaven and earn authority in the kingdom. Now, getting back to um, John chapter number 3, we read in verse 30, he says, He must increase, but I must decrease. He says in verse 31, He that cometh from above is above all. Um, and I think that this is now John the Apostle writing to us as the narrator, not John the Baptist speaking. After verse 30, it, it, it switches back to John the Apostle, I believe. And John the Apostle writes, He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. This is dealing with the fact that Jesus, He said in Matthew 28, He said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. In Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse 21, we're told that Jesus is above every principality and power. In Philippians 2, 9, we're told that Jesus has a name that is above every name. And so, Jesus is of heaven. Jesus is from Above, and we should hear his words. It goes on to say that he that uh, he that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. Um, and you know, John, while he was a very godly man, 
He was a uh, just a man. Um, the only things that John had to give us were the things that God gave to him to give to us. The only thing I have to give to you is what God has given me in this book. Human preachers, we are limited in giving you know, the Word of God to you to what God has given to us. But uh, Jesus is different. Listen to verse 32. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. Jesus gets what he has straight from God. Straight from God the Father. We read in verse 33, He that hath received his testimony hath sent to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Do you get that part? God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Jesus has the Spirit without measure. Once again, the, the revelation that we have is limited to what God gives to us. And, um, you know, so we need to listen to Jesus. That's, that's, that's a message that John the, John's disciples needed to hear. That's a, a message that we all need to hear. Is that Jesus is the one who's most important. I want you to believe me as a preacher. But you better believe Jesus above me. You better search the scriptures to see whether these things are so. You better believe Jesus above any man on this earth. Even John. And Jesus said that John was the greatest man to ever live other than Jesus himself. Now, back up there to, uh, you know, verse 32. And what he hath seen and heard that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. And, you know, that's similar to what we read in John chapter number 1. He was in the world, and the world, you know, was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But then it went on to say, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And we read in verse 33, he that hath received his testimony. You know... This shows most people don't receive Jesus. Most people reject Jesus. The Bible says, Broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. But for those few, he that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. Very quickly, look at 1 John chapter 5 with me. We're in the book of 1 John on Sunday mornings now, so um, uh, you can tune in to, to hear all about the gospel, the first epistle of John. We're in the first epistle of John on Sunday mornings. We're in the gospel of John during our, our weekly Bible study program. But in 1 John chapter 5 and uh, verse 10, we read, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. My friend, God is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When a person, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, if you've heard the gospel and you have rejected it, listen to me. You are calling God a liar. That is a very, very terrifying thing. That's why you're under condemnation if you don't believe in Jesus Christ. That's why you're under condemnation if you have not received Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Because by rejecting Christ, you're calling God a liar. There in John chapter number 3, we're going to try to finish it up. Look there at uh, verse 35. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into His hand. We talked a few lessons ago about how amazing it is that God the Father would give Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, His beloved Son. The Father loveth the Son. How amazing it is that He would give Him for us. I don't how you know we sing the song and how can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's love? Died He for me that brought Him pain. Verse 36, very important. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Did you hear that? He that believeth on the Son at that very moment possesses everlasting life. Eternal life isn't something you get when you get to heaven. It's something you get the moment that you are saved. It says, And he that believeth not the Son, he that disobeys the command to believe. We have been commanded to believe on Jesus Christ. 
And to reject Jesus Christ, we said that men are already under condemnation. But if you, re- when you, if you reject Jesus Christ, it involves you in an aggravated condemnation. There, hell becomes even hotter for those who reject Jesus Christ and reject Jesus Christ and reject Jesus Christ. He, verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. My friend, Jesus Christ took the wrath of God on the cross for you. When he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me from the cross of Calvary? He was bearing your sin and my sin and all the sins of the entire world. He came through it and he said, it is finished. You don't have to remain under God's wrath. You can have salvation. You can have eternal life. And it's as easy as ABC. Admit that you are a sinner. Believe on Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Believe that He died on the cross for your sins. Believe that He rose again from the dead. Don't just believe in Him. Believe on Him. Trust Him. Trust that He died for you. And then see, call upon His name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You believe and you call and Jesus Christ will answer. You ask Him to forgive your sin and save your soul from the bottom of your heart out of repentance and faith. He will save you and He will save you forever. Let's have a closing prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank You so very much for the Gospel. I thank You, Lord, for making it so very simple that, uh, that, that a child can understand it. Lord, I pray that people don't reject it because it's so simple. Lord, convict the hearts of those who need to be saved. Let them know they're lost. Let them know that they are sinners on their way. Um, to a devil's hell. Let them know that they're under your wrath if they haven't received you as Lord and Savior. And Lord, just convict them that all they have to do is believe on you. And they'll go from being a child of the devil to being a child of God. They'll enter into the family of God. They'll be born again. They'll become a new creature in Christ. They'll have the Holy Spirit and dwell their heart. All their sins will be washed away. And they'll receive a peace that passes understanding. Lord God, I thank you for those that are listening that are saved. I pray that we might be encouraged to lovingly tell a lost world how to be saved, to warn them about the consequences of their sin and to point them to you. Forgive us of our sins, all these things we ask in your name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and have a a closing hymn. I've picked out number 164. Brother John, you want to come up here and sing with me? I got a guest in here today, so... Come on up here and sing with me. It's not, I sing by myself because I have to, not because I want to. So Brother John's going to come in over here. (laughs) And we're going to sing together. Do you know 164, Break Thou the Bread of Life? If not, we can pick something different. Let's do 165, Word of God Across the Ages. That was probably easier, huh? (laughs) All right. Word of God across the ages Comes thy message to our life Source of hope forever present In our toils and fears and strife Constant witness to God's mercy, still our grace, whatever befall, God unveiling strength eternal, offer freely to us all. Story of man's wondrous journey from the shadows of the Sage and prophet guiding forward into light, words and deeds of Christ our Master pointing to the life and way, still appealing, still inspiring, mid the struggles of today. In the time of all the peoples 
May the message bless and heal as devout and patient scholars more and more its depths reveal. Bless, O oh God, to wise and simple all thy truth of ageless worth till all lands receive the witness and thy knowledge fills the earth. From Antioch Missionary Baptist Church in Wichita, Kansas, and for the Bible Trail, me and Brother John wish you a happy day. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in with us, and Lord willing, we will see you tomorrow. God bless. And church tonight will be posting a, uh, a uh, lesson on Ephesians tonight, so tune in for that too. God bless.